So last week we started looking at uh, water analysis and last week we were looking at water quality. Today we're going to be looking at the other water issue and that has to do with water quantity. So if you remember from last week we were talking about uh, how water is distributed and the amount of water on earth. So if you remember water ca uh, covers about 70 percent of the earth's surface, right, because majority of it is oceans and 97% of that water is salt water. The remaining 3% is fresh water, and out of that 3%, 70% uh, of it, of that fresh water, is trapped in ice and snow and glaciers, and the remaining 30% comes from groundwater. And groundwater is one of the things that we're going to be looking at today. So, First thing we're going to be considering in today's lab is the water or the hydrologic cycle. Okay. Now the way the cycle works is here we have our cloud and here we have the ground. Now water in the form of precipitation is going to come from the atmosphere down to the ground and when it hits the ground one of two things can occur. One is that the water can infiltrate into the ground, bless you, and that's what gives you groundwater. And I have a model of that which we will take a look at in a few minutes. The other possibility is when it hits the ground, it's not going to infiltrate, and rather it's going to appear as runoff. And in today's lab, we're going to see uh, what contributes to uh, runoff. Mainly, it's going to be topography and different types of surfaces. Now this water, after getting into the ground or on the ground, can come back to the atmosphere. And so that process can either be through evaporation or if I have, say, any trees or plants, the trees can evaporate the water vapor back into the atmosphere. And that event is called transpiration. And then once in the atmosphere, we can, um, the, the water vapor will then condense or condensation, and that's eventually going to give you back your cloud. So the first thing that you're going to do in today's lab is you're going to look at different aspects of the water cycle. And so one of them I have here. It's not the enchanted rose from uh, Beauty and the Beast, it's my enchanted radish, but you sort of get the same result, is here's a radish plant, and what do you notice happening on the bell jar? Well, you're the one closest. What do you say? Um, fogging up. Uh, it's fogging up, which means that there is water vapor. So the water that was in the soil, the pot, that water vapor has now been released and it's trapped in the bell jaw. That's the process of transpiration. So first thing in today's lab is you're going to come up and make some observations about our enchanted radish. Are we okay with that? Okay. So now we're going to take a look at a bit more carefully the idea of runoff and groundwater. So I'll start off with the groundwater. Okay. Now, both groundwater and runoff uh, can be considered part of a watershed. And so a watershed is the area of land that is defined by topography where all water, when it uh, lands in this area, is going to accumulate in one particular location. And typically that's going to be either a stream or river and then eventually making its way back out to the ocean. Okay. So if you see from this animation, when water lands in this watershed or this area, 
all of the water, whether it infiltrates in, see some of it's infiltrating in, and some of it is running as runoff, all of it is eventually going to accumulate here at this river. That's what we refer to as a watershed. And that's one of the things that you're going to mimic today when you use the sandbox. You are going to recreate a watershed. So uh, as far as within Philadelphia, we belong to the Delaware uh, River watershed. And then uh, it can be divided up into sub, sub water, sub, yeah, try that again, sub watersheds. And the one we belong to is uh, the Schuylkill watershed. So when we have precipitation, that water eventually will make its way to the Schuylkill River. Okay. So first thing is, how do we get the groundwater? So water has to be able to infiltrate in. And when that occurs, you have your soil. And water is going to start to fill up in that soil. And so what you end up happening, having are these two zones. The first zone is the saturated zone. Okay. And that's where the water can you know, uh, infiltrate in and start to build up. The other area is the unsaturated zone. And uh, here you have spaces, and not all of it is completely filled with water. Now the space that is uh, right at the border between the saturated zone and the unsaturated zone is what we refer to as the water table. And it's typically going to the water table where we get our groundwater from, right? So you dig a well, and you can pick up groundwater that way. In lecture, did Dr. McRobert talk about fracking? And we've, what is one of the concerns about fracking? Yes? It damages the drinking water. It damages the drinking water, right, specifically we're talking about contaminating the water table. So uh, in next week's lab, when we look at soil, we're going to see how we can perform soil analysis to see where the water table is. You know, if it's, if it's been a very rainy season, then the water table is higher. That means more soil is saturated with water. And when it's a drought or a dry season, the water table goes down because there's less water gain into the, into the system. Are we OK with this? Now, how we actually get that water from groundwater, I'm sorry, how we get that water from in the ground is through aquifers. And an aquifer is a water permeable rock. So here, I have my ground, and then beneath it is my groundwater. So this is the water that was able to infiltrate in. And the water, here again is my water table, that boundary between unsaturated soil and saturated soil. And I can have this groundwater here unconfined which means then all I have to do is just dig a well, and I can collect that water. However, some groundwater can get uh, beneath this impermeable layer, you know, if it uh, seeped in over here and then made its way down. So you have this confining layer of impermeable rock, and you have groundwater that's trapped there. So that's referred to as the confined aquifer, and using special types of wells, you can actually dr drill down past the confining layer and get to water that way. Now, the idea of groundwater is very dynamic. And to show you that, I have a uh, groundwater model set up. So if you want to just leave your books for 30 seconds, we can take a look at that. OK. So. Here is a sample, here, here's a model of an aquifer, if you will. 
I have uh, two lakes here. The pipes that you see here are my wells. Up here is the unconfined. There's water in here as well. And then down here beneath this layer of clay, which is representing my impermeable barrier, I have a confined aquifer here. Okay? And as I suggested, groundwater is very dynamic, and I can show you that with this. Imagine that I am the big bad chemical company, and I want to get rid of my uh, chemical waste. And um, I decide to just dump it into the lake. Okay? So I'm going to take my hazardous chemical, some green food dye, and I'm going to uh, dump it into my lake. We're going to let this go for a while, and when you start lab, I want you to come back and look at this to see if the contaminant has stayed there or if it has moved uh, to somewhere else in the model. Okay. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to try to contaminate one of the wells. Okay. I put the contaminant into one of the wells as well. Get it? Wells as well. <laughs> and we're going to see if the contaminant stays in the well or if it uh, spreads out. And um, to make sure that no one has actually seen me doing this, I'm going to pump the well quickly just to make sure everything's gotten down. There you go. So we'll let that sit. And when you start lab, I want you to come back and see what's happened. Okay, so this one, there is no barrier to the top, so all I gotta do is just drill down and I can get to my water. The unconfined, I'm sorry, the confined one is water that has seeped in somewhere else, has made its way over here, and now there is a impermeable barrier. So I can't just simply drill, you know, dig down and get to that water. Okay, so basically you just have another layer of rock on top of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Ba basically, the big difference is you have this additional layer and another layer of water beneath. Say from a different source. Yeah, so like it could come over here where that barrier is not located. And because, again, groundwater is dynamic, that water could have made its way over to here. And oops, now it is confined. Does that make sense? OK. So that's groundwater. We're now going to consider runoff and what affects runoff. All right, so let me erase this. All right. So we have our groundwater. Now we're going to consider what influences runoff. And the two major things that contribute to runoff have to deal with surfaces and topography. So there are two types of surfaces we consider. One type of surface is known as pervious. And pervious means that it allows water to percolate in. So if I'm going to generate uh, groundwater, I need to have a pervious surface because that's going to allow water to get in. So water can infiltrate. And then the other type is impervious. So if pervious means that water can infiltrate, what do you think impervious means? Water cannot, right. So impervious means that water cannot infiltrate. So if I have a pervious surface, then I can get groundwater. And if I have an impervious surface, well, the water's not going to go into the ground. It's going to come off as runoff. Okay? And you can see that here in this diagram, where if I have a pervious surface, more water can get in, and some runoff occurs. While here, when I have an impervious surface, less water gets in, and more runoff occurs. Are we OK with surfaces? 
Okay. The other is topography. And topography refers to the uh, shape and elevation of a particular area. And topography can, um, is one of those things that affects climate. And you can see that here in this diagram. Here I have a mountain. And on one side of the mountain, I have uh, cooler conditions, moister conditions. And on the other side of the mountain, I have warmer temperatures and uh, drier conditions. So that's why in certain places, one side of the mountain will have one type of climate, and the other side of the mountain will have a different type of climate because of that elevation affects the air pressure. And affecting the air pressure, therefore, is going to dictate what type of climate you have. So that's one way topography can affect climate. And topography, obviously, is going to affect my watershed, because depending upon how the land is formed, that's going to control where the water goes. So you're going to see the role of topography in affecting watersheds and, therefore, runoff. So the first thing you're going to consider with topography is the slope of the land. So if you remember from uh, high school math, the formula for slope is the change in y over the change in x, which is y2 minus y1 divided by x2 minus x1. And y represents the change in elevation divided by the change in distance. So I have these inclined planes where you can manipulate the angle of your slope. And you're going to time to see how long it takes for water to run down that inclined plane. So what do you think is going to happen? As I increase the angle of my slope, what do you think is going to happen to my water? More not only more runoff, but in terms of speed, faster. faster. Okay, so you're going to test that to see if that's correct. Um, in your lab manual, turn to page 70, uh, can I steal your book for a second? Thank you. 73. Okay, there are uh, two changes to make. The first is your inclined plane does not go as high as I thought it did. So the angles you'll be testing are 10, 20, 30, 45, and there is no 70. The other change is uh, when you calculate your speed, the units, I put it in meters per second. That's not correct. It's centimeters per second because the ramp isn't that, that big. OK? Bless you. So you're going to be. Uh, measuring how fast runoff occurs as you change the slope. And we'll see if Morgan's hypothesis is correct that, what was it again? It'll be, It'll be faster as I increase the angle. Okay. So slope is one aspect of topography that we can look at. Okay. Now, the other way you're going to figure out uh, what's at most risk with topography is by using a topographic map. And so before I get into how a topographic map works, I want to take a few minutes to explain the importance of a map, that maps can do more for you than just tell you where to go. You know, I'm always embarrassed that I have to turn on my GPS to figure out where I'm going, and that's more embarrassing when where I need to go is like right down the road, like no turns. That's really embarrassing. And so the example of a map uh, I want to talk to you about is uh, this one. And this is known as the ghost map. It shows a map of an outbreak of cholera in the 1850s. Has anyone heard of cholera before? What do you know about cholera? Bad water OK. What do you know about cholera? 
Is it a bacterium or a virus? Bacterium. bacterium. Very good. Okay. So cholera is, as David said, is typically found in bad drinking water, and it is a disease caused by a bacterium known as Vibrio cholerae. And so in the 1850s, there was an outbreak of cholera in London. And uh, what John Snow did here was he went around and um, recorded how many people were sick. And the way he did that was by preparing a bar graph. But instead of putting the bar graph on a normal XY axis, it was overlaid on this map. So the different bars that you see here correspond to the number of cases of cholera that were in that location. And for individuals who have cholera, uh, typically what happens is uh, you uh, get diarrhea, you lose all of your water. So what do people then go and do? Drink more water, right, to stay hydrated except the bacterium basically has uh, caused you to lose all uh, retention of your water. So you're drinking water to stay hydrated. Well, all that's going to happen is you're going to have more diarrhea because basically your body can't retain any liquids. Not a particularly nice disease. So if I look at the ghost map here, where is the highest incidences of cholera. What's near there? The pump. The water pump. Exactly. And so that's how he figured out what the contamination source was, that it was this contaminated water pump which resulted in all of these cases of cholera. So the moral of the story is that you can use maps not just for navigation, but you can use it as a means of presenting scientific data, like a graph. Or instead of using x, y, you can put information onto a map. And that is something that we still do today, although we have a much fancier name for it called uh, GIS, Geographic Information Systems. And in a little bit, I'll show you how that works. Are we okay with this? Okay. So I can take a map, and as you saw with the ghost map, I can put um, information or data onto my map. And when I do that, that is referred to as a field map. So a field map is something that has assigned quantities or values to a particular location. So in this picture here, it's corresponding to the price of gas relative to the service station. I can then draw what is known as an isoline. And an isoline connects all values that are the same, right? The prefix iso means the same. So if I look at my map again, everywhere, anywhere I walk along this line, will always have the same price. This one looks like it's $40. Okay, so that's an ISO line. Anywhere I walk on that line, I'm always going to have the same value. And then I can uh, draw several ISO lines so I know, again, wherever I'm walking, it is always going to be worth the same value. And so you can have uh, maps with isolines that uh, show air pressure or temperature. So sometimes you might see weather maps on TV shown this way. And in the case of topography, what we're interested in today, topography shows isolines of elevation. Okay. So your topographic map. shows ISO lines, remember ISO means the same value, of elevation. So here's an example of a topographic map showing a hill. So the hill has different elevations and basically you're looking at it from a bird's eye view. You're looking down. 
So anywhere I walk along this isoline here is always going to be, bless you, is always going to be 140 meters. That's my elevation. And then as I work my way down the hill to lower elevations, that's where I get these circles from here. Okay, so basically a topographic map is a two-dimensional picture of a three-dimensional structure. And you're looking at it from a bird's eye view, looking down. Are we okay with that? Now, the spacing between the lines tells you whether or not you have a steep slope, therefore, you know, high angle, or a gradual slope, or a small angle. And the way you tell the difference between those is by the spacing. So if the lines, if the ISO lines are closer together, you have a steep slope. And if the lines are further spaced apart, then you have gradual slope. And you can see that uh, cl more clearly in this picture. Here, the ISO lines are closer together. So that means this area has steep slope, while the ISO lines over here are much further spread out. So that means you're going to have gradual slope. And so the way a topographic map works is you will have an ISO line with a number on it that indicates the elevation. And then you count towards the next one, and then you can figure out the interval in between. So I have 100 and then 200, so then this tells me that this line will be 120, 140, 160, 180, and then 200. So you sort of look to the next number to figure out uh, what your elevation is in between. Are we okay with that? So you're going to recreate a topographic map today. I have a box at your bench, and you'll see it in three dimensions. And you're going to make a topographic map looking at it from a bird's eye view. And to help you figure out the elevations that you have, you're going to add water. Every inch, the water is going to represent 100 meters. And then you trace the line that you see. Are we okay with that? Yes? Good. Okay. So you're going to be given a map, and you're going to try to figure out which area in my map is at most risk for runoff damage. So there's some things that you're going to consider. The first thing that you're going to consider is um, your slopes. I'm sorry. First thing you're going to consider is whether or not you have any hills. Because hills, obviously, is going to slow water down. Can water work its way up the hill easily? No, water can go down the hill easily, but it's very hard for water to work its way up the hill. So if you have an area that has hills, then it's probably not going to be affected that much by runoff damage, because that water is all going to be contained here in these valleys. So you're going to prepare a graph of the elevations. So that will require you to look at the uh, ISO lines and then graph the actual elevations. After you consider uh, if there are any hills, you can then use slopes to see which area has the greater slope, because that might have greater damage. And then which area has pervious surfaces or impervious surfaces? Which one do you think will have more runoff damage, the pervious area or the impervious area? Impervious. The impervious area, correct. So you're going to sort of use all three concepts to figure out where on that map is going to be the most risk for runoff damage. So you're going to use the map. The other way you're going to figure out areas that are at risk for runoff damage is by using the sandbox. So the way the sandbox operates is you have uh, sand 
and uh, there is a uh, camera or a, an Xbox camera attached next to the projector and that measures the distance between the camera and the sand. So it's recording elevations. It's recording topography, right? Because topography is elevation. So you're going to uh, set up, I have at your bench, a topo map. You're going to recreate that topo map in 3D in the sand. And the box will allow you to mimic rain events in different locations. So you're going to make it rain in different places, and you're going to see if the water goes where you predict it would go. And the map indicates what type of land use it is, whether it's forest area, uh, agricultural, or industrial. And you're going to see if any pollutants end up going into uh, the lakes. And uh, one of the lakes is uh, Lake Forster. Had to have a little fun with that. The other one is Lake Violin for Dr. Violin, who also helped with this. And then you got Fingerut Hill for Dr. Fingerut, who also helped make this. So the three instructors, we decided to have a little fun with that. Okay? So one group at a time will have to use the sandbox because obviously I only have one box. Are we okay with topography and runoff? Yes? Okay. Now, there are certain map systems that are used today, okay? And one of them is GIS, what I mentioned earlier about layers, information being placed onto a map. And so I have an example I'd like to do with you to show you how GIS works. Um, I was deprived when I was uh, little living on Staten Island. You know what we did not have on Staten Island for the longest time? A sonic drive-in. <laughs> the, the old drive-ins? Yeah, there was none of that on Staten Island. And those commercials certainly looked good, especially the slushies. Anyway, after eight, is that the deal? Anyway, whatever. Okay. Now, what, the best way I think I can explain GIS is to take it from a business point of view. How many of you are in the business school? Okay. Suppose I want to open up my own Sonic, okay? except I want to use a map to figure out, let me shut the door, hold on. Except I want to use GIS to figure out where I should open up my Sonic. So this is my map. This is the general area I want to open up my Sonic. What information do you think I need to have in order to open up my Sonic? Because I want to open it up somewhere where I'm going to make money. Yeah. You have to learn the laws of Staten Island. They might have restrictions on various things. All right. I can open up a Sonic. All right. Good. Ah, uh, my competitors, all right. Well, I just happen to have a layer of data for that. So GIS means that I add layers of data. Okay, there's my, my competitors. What else should I know if I want to open up a Sonic? Yeah. Um, that's... We're going to put that in there. Here are my other restaurants. Yes, Paige. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's like uh, the opposite of field of dreams. You have to build it where they are, you know, instead of if you build it, they will come. You've got to go where they are. All right? Here is where the people are. What else if I want to open up a Sonic drive-in? Yeah, right? Because I don't want, it's got to be somewhere where they're driving. I just happen to have a layer of data for that. So I'm going to overlay that as well. And if you look, you can see this area is a good location. There's no competitors or no other restaurants there. I have a good population size and 
I got roads. That's GIS. That's what we do today. We take a general map and we add layers upon layers of information. And you can use that for a whole slew of things. Here I've given you a simple example of how you could use GIS in setting up, say, a business plan. Or well, what you're going to do in lab is you're going to figure out how can I use GIS to figure out a location that is at risk for runoff damage. So you're going to start with a simple map and then sort of like this. What layers of data would you want to put on your map so when you're done you can look and go, that's, that's the location. And it's a hypothetical, so I want you and your group to think about, well, what layers do you think you would want? Okay? All right. So that's GIS. And then the last uh, method of looking at maps today is using satellites. Because until we had satellites, everything we knew about maps had to be land-based, right? You had to go out there and look at the land and make a map of that. Now we have satellites that help us with that. And so you have two different types of satellites you can use. You can have ones that are um, geostationary, which means that it is orbiting at the same rate as the Earth turning, so you can always get the same location at any time in the day. Okay, So that's geostationary, so it's moving around at the same speed as the Earth rotates. Or you can do polar orbiting. So as this turns, you have your satellite going this way. Okay. And so which one you use is really dependent upon what information you want to have, whether you want to track a particular location at all times during the day, or if you want to see everything that goes on you know, as the Earth turns this way. Are we OK with that? All right. So why do I look at this? Why am I interested in topography and runoff? Well, in terms of climate change, you're going to have areas that are going to have more precipitation and areas with less precipitation. You will have areas with more runoff and you will have areas with less runoff. So being able to identify what locations are at risk due to changes in climate is a valuable thing to know. <clears throat> because otherwise, things like this happen, where you have uh, basically flooding. Okay. So what are some ways that we can reduce runoff? So how do I, what are some methods that I can use to reduce runoff? Okay. Well, one, you can tell me now. What type of surfaces do you think I should use if I want to reduce runoff? Imper Peter. Uh, yeah, good. Okay, so how do I reduce runoff? Okay. So yeah, one of them is uh, more pervious surfaces. Another is to alter the topography. So here I have a picture of, uh, this is good old Staten Island again with the Verrazano Bridge, which costs $17 to cross. Not that I'm grumpy about that at all. <laughs> but you can see that you, we, they put this sand hill here. Because during Superstorm Sandy a few years ago, this entire area got wiped out. So just the fact that you've altered your topography a little bit will slow water down. Remember, water can't go up the hill easily. Or in this diagram here, where this picture here, so if there is any runoff, the runoff is going to accumulate in this little valley here. That's the value of having hills. So that's going to help with reducing runoff. You've altered your topography. Okay. Some locations uh, will not mow the grass. Why? Because having uh, the large weeds and the larger grass there is also going to slow water down. Okay. So reduce mowing is another way. 
Uh, Peter mentioned uh, pervious surfaces. There's a uh, pervious pavement on campus. Next time you're near uh, Mandeville's parking lot, the Mandeville parking lot is a pervious pavement, which means that if you take a little bit of water on a nice dry day and you pour it, it will infiltrate in. Okay? Now don't take like 10 gallons of water and put it on the parking lot. It will run off, but if it's a nice dry day, you can pour a little bit of water and it should seep in. That's going to reduce runoff. You can also uh, prepare what are known as rain gardens and green roofs. This is the rain garden that is in front of the Science Center and the Post Learning Commons. And next time you look at it, you'll see that it's on a hill. The idea being that when it rains, the water runoff is going to run down. So it's a hill, so changing topography. It runs down, and the water and the plants that are at the bottom of the hill, the rain garden, can use that water. Okay. Now, there is a drain there, so if there is too much water, some of that water will go into uh, the drain. But the idea is that the plants can use that water. So we're using runoff that way. Now the plants that they pick is purposely chosen for plants. You, you don't go watering rain gardens. The idea is those plants only get watered when you have uh, rain. So these plants should be able to survive periods of time without any watering and should be able to survive if they get doused with a lot of water. So you're choosing very hardy plants for that. The same principle applies to a green roof. And we have two green roofs. We have one uh, on the Science Center, where Dr. McRobert also has one of his turtle houses, which I'm sure he's talked about. And we have another one on the uh, Post Learning Commons. Uh, this one, the Science Center one, that one's uh, more accessible than the Post Learning one. But the same principle, you have these garden patches here with uh, different plants. And they should be able to survive periods of no rain, and then should be able to survive if they get a good douse of, of rainwater. And the plants are absorbing that water, so less water goes down the piping and into the sewers and occurring as runoff. So your plants are using some of that water to reduce uh, your runoff volume. Again, either as a rain garden or on top of the roof as a green roof. Are we okay with that? All right. Any questions? All right. So you have your transpiration to look at. You have my model to take a look at. You have some topographic maps to make. And we'll have one group at a time come up and uh, play with the sandbox. Have at it. <laughs>